haya kusema wewe wangu na mimi wako baba baba asante sana baba mokozi wangu mimi 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 sitaona haya kusema wewe wangu na mimi baba 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 ninakupenda asante sana baba mokozi wangu mimi 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 sitaona haya kusema wewe wangu na mimi baba baba ninakupenda mimi mimi sitaona haya kusema wewe wangu na mimi oh maisha yangu wewe baba nisaidie nisaidie baba maisha yangu wewe baba nisaidie nisaidie baba Hakuna Mungu kama wewe Hakuna Mungu kama wewe Hakuna Mungu kama wewe Hakuna na hata kuwepo Hakuna Hakuna Mungu kama wewe Hakuna Mungu kama wewe Hakuna Nimetembea nimetembea kote kote nimetafuta kote kote nimezunguka kote kote hakuna na hata oh nimetembea kote oh nimetafuta kote Zunguka kote oh hakuna na one more time nimetembea nimetembea kote nimetafuta kote ko nimezunguka kote hakuna na now let's sing tembea na yesu Tembea na Yesu e na Yesu e me na le Oh tembea na Yesu na Yesu e na Yesu e Tembea 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 na Yesu e Oh tembea 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 Na Yesu amen haleluya amen Na sema sante kwa Mungu wangu Na sema sante kwa wema kwa ma Fadili zako za dumu milele na milele amina nitaimba nitaimba sifa zako mbele ya watu wote nita Nothing. 
Rev. Murage will lead us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty, everlasting Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you this afternoon. We give you praise and glorify your name for the gift of life. The Lord, you have preserved each one of us. Thank you, O God Almighty, for gathering us in this place and this day. King of kings and Lord of wrongs, we repent of the sins that we have committed. We ask that you forgive us and cleanse us, that this service may be acceptable before you. We welcome your mighty presence to be with us this afternoon, O God Almighty, that you may minister to us, O God, that you may cause this occasion, O God Almighty, to be a good one, O God Almighty, that you may beautify it with your presence, even with your glory. Lord, we pray that in Jesus' mighty name, that you release your presence, O oh God Almighty, that even in this launch, O oh God, even our hearts will be launched afresh unto you, O oh God Almighty, that we may continue to walk with you, O oh God, that we may continue to experience your presence. O oh God, we purify ourselves as we meet with you this afternoon, that our praise and worship may be acceptable before you, that even you release a word to each one of us this day, that we may be edified in your presence. We thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us appreciate the Lord for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Wow. Could you just again turn to your neighbor and tell them welcome to this extraordinary book lounge. Yeah, welcome them, welcome them, welcome them. Amen, amen. And just before you take your seats, I'd like us to welcome the guests of honor. And just to highlight from Evangelist Captain, she says the guest of honor is God, as he is the author of this great book. Could we appreciate the Lord? Appreciate him. Amen, amen, amen. And also just to acknowledge and celebrate Evangelist Margaret Thuo, who says she's just a pen in the hands of the author. Let's appreciate her as well. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You may take your seats. Amen, I love that. <laughs> thank you, thank you so, so much. Wow. Indeed, what a joy to be here this beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Indeed, Psalms 118 says in 23, this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Isn't it marvelous? Just to be here to witness this great, extraordinary launch. Let's appreciate the Lord once again for this beautiful day. Amen. Amen. And just to take us next, we are going to begin with a welcome remark and speech. And I'd like to invite Mr. Peter Thuo to take the podium to address us. But before he does that, I'd just like to share a brief introduction about him. He's a walking deacon to be ordained as a deacon on the 21st of this month at St. John Baptist Church in Boston. Let's appreciate. Amen. <laughs> wow. Wow. Wow, I love the joy in this place. He's also the firstborn of evangelist Margaret Thu, and he's also husband to Paris Swanza. You can just <laughs> well, let's appreciate her as well. <laughs> and I can see their lovely daughter as well. You can just wave. <laughs> Amen. Thank you and welcome. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I think. Only tall people are supposed to do welcomes because you see what this microphone is. <laughs> but anyway, um, Karibuni, welcome. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't the Lord amazing? Can we give the Lord a hand clap? <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hearing my cry. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> God is amazing. So, um, 
minds to welcome, and um, I'm so glad we first started by welcoming the Lord to this place, because this is about ministry, and this is about a God who's done so many things that are amazing. I've had the honor of uh, knowing the author for over 50 years, so we go way back. <laughs> we go way back. So God is good. Yeah. Now, um, I'm not going to give a political speech, but we'll start also by saying, any Gen Z in the house? Gen Z, oh yeah, where you at? All right, all right, God bless you, God bless you. All right, all right, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, all right. Um, so, Provost, we want to thank you so much. Welcome to um, this launch. We want to thank you for being available to launch the book and um, for accepting it, uh, accepting the invite. So thank you so much. We'd also like to welcome any ministers in the house. Um, there must be at least one. Please stand. We want to acknowledge you. Reverence, pastor, <laughs> Karibuni sana, servants of God, Karibuni sana. Also like to uh, welcome anybody from Sitam. Sitam, Sitam. Yeah, <laughs> Karibuni sana. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. Uh, Baptist Church. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Karibu, Karibu. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. Uh, PCA, Mutero. PCA. Oh, yeah. All right. Karibu, Karibu, Karibu. Yeah, thank you. All right. Chachami, captains and stuff. Karibu. Welcome, 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 welcome. All right. Okay. Langam. Langam. Yeah, welcome. All right. United Nations, retired and active. United Nations, oh, Akonje. Okay. All right, welcome. All right. Deliverance Ministry. Anybody from the Deliverance Ministry? All right. Uh, we'll say they're on their way. They are still delivering somewhere. Um, Valley Arcade Cell Group. Cell Group. I think I saw a few people. Ah, welcome. Yeah, Karibuni Sana. Okay. Uh, all family members? Family members? Oh, welcome, 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 welcome. All right. Okay. All friends and business partners of Evangelist Margaret Thuo. Hey, all right. Karibuni, Karibuni. All right. Um, Anglican Evangelistic Enterprise. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. And um, anybody else I didn't mention? Please raise your hand. Anybody else? All saints? All saints? All saints? Anybody all saints? All saints? Yeah, all saints. Oh, my goodness. How can we forget the hosts? Yes. Hosts, Karibuni Sana. And thank you. Thank you. We thank God, and again, this is a welcome, not only to a launch, but also to an opportunity to fellowship, to thank God for all the amazing things he's done, and it is so wonderful to be in your midst. May God bless each and every one of you. Asante. Amen. Let's appreciate him better. Thank you so very much, Mr. Peter. Do you feel at home now? Yes? Wow, turn to your neighbor again and tell them, welcome. <laughs> wow, wow, what a joy to be here. Welcome, Karibuni Sana. Even for those who are joining from the U.S., welcome, welcome. At this point, we are going to proceed on well, and we are going to be having speeches. And to start us, we have Beatrice Thuo. Thank you. Let's appreciate her as he, she comes. <laughs> wow. Welcome, 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 Beatrice. And maybe just to share something brief about Beatrice. She's an intercessor and member of Brooklyn Tabernacle at Brooklyn, New York, USA. Let's appreciate her. She's also the second born of evangelist Margaret Thuo. Thank you, Beatrice. Welcome. <laughs> 
thank you, Provost, and thank you, um, men of God, for, uh, for just coming. We really thank you that you're here. But um, so to um, an honorary Gen Z, I've decided what we, we came from. <laughs> We landed from New York yesterday, and all I could hear was about the Gen Zs, and I, have, I, was, I said I have to join this Gen Z movement. So I'm honorary Gen Z, although I'm really Gen X, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, Karibuni, I, I think as we've all said, we're really welcome. We're thankful to God. So I think that's our first, you know, mom has raised us and from generation to generation that we all give thanks to God. So we are really grateful to our Father, our Heavenly Father, that we are here for making this day possible. Um, I'm, I'm the second born, but I'm also my mom's twin sister and twin daughter. Uh, I used to say when I was, <laughs> I could never do anything wrong because when I was in Nairobi, just walking the streets, someone would come and say, are you Margaret Thu's daughter? I'm like, uh, I think so. So I could, so I could never really do anything bad because I look just like her. So, um, but first I want to say, secondly, I want to say thank you so much for all, having all of you here. It's a blessing. The way you've supported mom. I know a lot, a lot of you came here voluntarily. Others uh, through my mom's persuasion of text. I have to say my mom is the best marketer. I've never seen a marketing woman like that. I thought her gift was in communication until this book happened. Uh, people in the U.S. are buying books. Everybody's buying books. And so it's a blessing to have mom. She's at 77, but she's full of energy. She's, she's vital. And it's God who's blessed her. But if you want anything marketed, just hire Mrs. Margaret Thu, and I'll be her yeah. agent. So I'm here to say a little bit about the book. Uh, I have to say, I was listening the other day to this man of God who had just published a book uh, in Nigeria. And the people explaining the book were talking about the spine of the book. You know, they're saying the font is amazing and the font is great. So I was like, maybe that's what I should do for mom's book. Anyway, as you can see, this is a beautiful book. The pictures inside, the, the font, everything. But above all, it's what's inside here, right? It's life-changing. I think it's a message that's very timely about our spirit life. You know, I think that's something Jesus always told us, but I don't think we all got that. Uh, if you look at Paul, if you're reading Paul's books, he's really stressing that we are spirit, soul, and then body. And your spirit should be the first thing in your life, right? And we should all be praying that we walk in the spirit. That we, once you're in the spirit, you know the power you have, you know the impact you have, you know the calling of God on your life. So I think this book, especially during this time, it's a very timely book. It, we, we, the world is getting smaller, the challenges are so many, the darkness is also expanding, but so is the light of God and the light of Jesus. So I think this is a very timely book. And we thank God for giving mom the inspiration, the anointing to write this book. And please buy a copy for, you have two copies for you, um, a copy for your friends. So thank you so much for coming to support this. May you all be blessed and may your many special blessings on God for coming to support this book. And mom, we love you. We are so proud of you. <laughs> um, my sister could not make it, but you know, the two siblings are here, you know, you know, the first and the second. And, uh, but uh, mom has really raised us to, um, to really thank God and just put God first. So um, thank you for all the lessons you've, you've given us. You continue to be a model. You continue to challenge us, you know, just when we, we think we've reached where you are, then you go to the next step. So now I have to think what I need to do at 77. Maybe I'll fly a plane. I don't know. So, but um, thank you for just being that shining example and shining model and that we are, you're always challenging us every day. So Asante Sana, may God bless you and continue multiplying for you. And welcome, Asante. Wow. Wow, that was beautiful. Let's appreciate Beatrice once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's beautiful that the mom is serving as a role model and makes her think, what can I do next? Wow, let's appreciate her once again. Thank you so very much. Wow. At this point, we're going to hear from Sarah Thu. I'll just briefly introduce her. She's a minister in St. Stephen Ministry at Living Water Community Church in Chicago, USA. She's a backbone of Evangelist Margaret. Let's appreciate her even in absentia. <laughs> Thank you. For today, Sarah is presented by Dr. Monica Wanja, 
who's very active in mission work for Jesus Christ and works at the United Nations. Let's appreciate Dr. Monica. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, my name is Wanjanganga, and Captain Margaret is my Auntie Margaret. She's a spiritual mentor to me, although, to be honest, she's my sparring partner. We usually have very heated discussions about the word of God. Yes. And today, I am not here as Wanja. I'm here as Sarah Thu. Uh, her speech had jokes, but Auntie Margaret was not very excited about jokes. Because, as you know, it is true that spiritual warfare is a very serious matter. One that we choose not to actually acknowledge in our daily lives, but it is very real. Okay, so this is Sarah. So sorry I could not be there with you today, and thank you for making the time to attend my mom's book launch. If you have read the book, you may know that a couple of testimonies feature very prominently in the book, and they're mine. I wanted to add some color to the testimony my mom put in the book about how we prayed for $46,000 in tuition for University of Pennsylvania. And God provided a scholarship for Boston University for the exact amount. One thing she doesn't mention is how miraculous the actual process of getting the news of the scholarship was. I would like to tell that testimony. <clears throat> I had applied to Boston University as one of my many universities and completely forgot about it. After finishing my coursework in undergrad, I had mo to move apartments uh, so as to move to the next chapter uh, and to move to a newer, cheaper apartment um, as I waited for the news of what my future would hold. I got a job in customer service as I waited and had settled into a routine of waking up going to work and coming back home. One day I came back home and got a voicemail on my cell phone. The voicemail said that FedEx had tried to deliver a package to me but could not reach me. So they asked me to pick up the package at their central package center. The voicemail was from my old apartment because the door buzzer there uh, had been connected to my cell phone. I had forgotten to disconnect it when I moved. Uh, I had no idea who had sent me a message. I went to FedEx and picked up the package and it was the acceptance and scholarship letter from Boston University. Had I not forgotten to disconnect my old apartment buzzer from my cell phone, I would have missed my scholarship. It was also a fulfillment of a promise I felt God has, had given me in university that I would be a leader and not, I, I, would, I would be a lender and not a borrower. Truly, God works in mysterious ways. Today, I am not with you because I felt warned in a dream not to travel without my children. After years of sometimes ignoring such messages, I am learning to trust in God's leading rather than what seems right in my eyes. I think you will see in the book, and hopefully you, you too will uh, acknowledge and you will experience in your, in your life that God's ways are higher than our ways. Thank you for listening to my testimony, and I hope that you will be blessed, and I know actually that you will be blessed by my mom's book, which she has, test, as she always testifies, was, the Holy, was Holy Spirit inspired and Holy Spirit directed. Thank you. Wow, thank you, thank you so much. Let's appreciate Wanja. Wachungaji, and all people who are here. Uh, when Margaret and her family were deciding on the date, they chose 13th of July. They didn't know, or they could not remember, that this day was a very special day for, Gomi, for Sarah Joki Gomi's family. The 13th of July is when my parents wedded. And that is almost, that is about 78 years, if I'm not mistaken. Today, if they were alive, they would be celebrating their marriage day in, in, in church. So 
these things are spiritual. And it is God who ordained that 78 years later, we will be celebrating the writing of the book of the first daughter. That is wonderful because God is a planner. God created us in his mind. We came into being, even before we came on earth physically, we were there spiritually. Things are spiritual. I thank God for the book that Margaret has written because when you go through that book, you find different teachings the importance of the word of God, the prayers, the, the altars, and everything. You go page by page and read that book, and you'll find it's a teaching book. Uh, now, we have just entered revival time. If you are awake spiritually, you will know that the, the revival has started. If you go back to the Bible, you will find that whenever there was a revival, God rose, uh, chose or raised teachers who will teach the word of God. Go to the time of Ezra. God raised Ezra that he may teach the Israelites the word of God. And so the Israelites came to separated and came back to the road during the time of Josiah, King Josiah. Even Christ, Jesus Christ, the word says, he's the greatest teacher that has ever lived. So during revival, God raises teacher, teachers. So I thank God that God has raised Margaret at this time, among others, to teach the word so that people may come back to God. We used to take things physically. And through Margaret's book that God has used her to write, we learn not to take things physically. For example, if somebody comes and makes some noise and all that, and that person wants you to get angry, you may get angry. But that's the devil's work because he wanted to get a praise to enter into your heart and now to, to scatter you or to do whatever he desires. So that's a warning. Things are spiritual. God is teaching us, even at this time, even as we run about the altars, the word of God, the prayers, the importance of prayers, the importance of the word of God, the prayer, importance of knowing about altars. He is teaching us so that we may know who we are and why we are here and where we are going. I thank God for my sister, Margaret, because she's a good example to us as her family members and also even to the nations and even to Kenya. Whoever will read that book will know that this is the inspired, this, this, this book, God is using this book to take us to another level in revival. Margaret, continue writing. This is just the beginning, not the end. It's the beginning, keep on writing, keep on writing until Jesus returns, until Jesus calls you home. What about you? You have a gift. Are you using that gift? Margaret is using that, that, that gift to write that book. What about you? What are your giftings? Question yourself. You did not come to this earth just to decorate the nations. You came with a purpose. What is your purpose? What is the mandate that God ordained for you? God bless you, Mubarak, you and Paka, you shall die. I love you. Amen. Let's appreciate, Mom. Thank you so much. What are your giftings? And, and, and I just speak to one clear thing. She said, you know, with the Holy Spirit, he helps us to understand who we are, why we are here, and where we are going. Could you turn to your neighbor and ask them, what's your purpose here? Are, are they aware? <laughs> you can engage them, engage them, get to, get to hear from them. <laughs> get to hear from them. 
and, and we are privileged that for us, even being here through the book, like she said, we are going to learn. You know, it's more of teaching guide just for us also to learn and basically engaging even in the place of prayer. Could we appreciate mom once again? Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. What a joy to be here in this space. At this point, we are going to head on to our next section. And I know you're wondering, why should I get this book? And just like Beatrice highlighted, get the book for yourself. Get it for your parents. Get it for your neighbors. Get it for your friends as well. So that they can also get to learn as well. The book and series are carefully crafted to help the believer victoriously navigate the unseen spiritual realm while living in the natural realm. The author mirac meticulously <laughs> explains that by virtue of the nature of God, the creator, humans are spiritual beings inhabiting physical bodies. The importance of relying on the Holy Spirit for guidance and understanding as opposed to the physical body or one intellect or physical strength is delved into as the author enlightens the reader on how to overcome the strategies of darkness. This book, could we just appreciate, you know, <laughs> that's a key aspect, how to overcome the strategies of darkness. This book and book series are a much needed guide to the person on a journey of faith unraveling mysteries and equipping the reader with the tools required to walk victoriously in Christ Jesus. Harness the power to overcome the hurdles you may be facing by understanding the various rules, accessing the resources available, and walking in your rightful authority as a child of God through the wisdom shared in the book. Ladies and gentlemen, could you join me in welcoming evangelist Margaret Thuo as she joins us here on stage. Let's just, let's appreciate her. Could you be upstanding? Welcome, welcome, mom. We celebrate you. Wow. So we need to appreciate that the Lord used her as a pen. Cindy, right. So I'm going to ask her a few questions because I mean, our grandmothers and our mothers. How many of them are writing, maybe by a show of hands? <laughs> yeah, so this is a special moment, isn't it? She was inspired and she obeyed. Cindy, yes. so mom, what drove you to write this book? And maybe just to help us glean into the process, what was it like? Uh, it's a long story, <clears throat> it's a long story. Because when I retired, I retired uh, from United Nations at 62, and I just wanted to serve the Lord. And I came to this, this cathedral, and I met the provost then. He's now a bishop, Julius, and I said I want to serve the Lord. Free of charge. He, he was shocked because he didn't know exactly, he has never heard of something like that. And he connected me to a Reverend Catherine, and uh, as we were talking, then uh, I, you know, I remember the first question was, have you been doing evangelism? I said, I've been proclaiming the gospel. I wasn't sure. I think I had not read the Bible very well to remember that that is one of the gifts that Jesus gave on evangelism. So he said, okay, have you been doing door to door? I said, I have no idea what door to door is. <laughs> so, so anyway, he, he, uh, she told me that there is a course that is going to be uh, started, a uh, church army and uh, that is in Christian ministries, and I should join with the church, in the church army. So very soon I started, and then there was a lot of um, also courses which were ongoing here on evangelism and uh, uh, on preaching as well. And I remember also joining Langham, and we are represented here by Mercy in Langham. Although she's short, she was my teacher. So she was my teacher in preaching, ex expository preaching. And uh, so I was, I also joined deliverance ministry. So I was involved in a lot of ministries in the, in the, in the kingdom of God, although then I didn't call it the kingdom of God, but, but in Christianity. And that is how it was. So it was in the course of doing all those courses that I realized actually I have a gift of evangelism. And I knew that even when I was in the, in the UN, 
I was doing evangelism even in the plane when we were sitting at the transit lodge. I brought a lot of people to Christ. I remember the taxis I used to use, you know, they, they, they belong to Marion who is here with us. And uh, Marion, even Marion I brought to Christ and the, and the drivers. And some of them who did not want to hear about Jesus, they would say, no, no, I don't want to carry Margaret. I don't want to drive Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I remember one of them just coming and saying, you know, we just, you know, I didn't talk that particular day. And then he said, by the way, have I ever told you about Jesus? And then he said, uh, in fact, I'm wondering, because I've, everybody has said that once you enter the car, it is about Jesus. So that, that has been a journey. So in 20, um, 2020, I was very sick in January, and um, as I was recovering after 10 days, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me that I have to come and uh, start you know, do evangelism at Ubuntu Park. And that is what I did. And I started. And I must uh, thank uh, uh, Provost, the present Provost, because he would find me at the parking lot and just pray with me and encourage me. And a lot of people came to Christ. And uh, also, uh, you know, Reverend, uh, the Reverend who, gave, who was giving me the books. So, so I did appreciate that, you know, the Bibles, because I was also sharing the Bibles with those who didn't have. In fact, it came to a point where I was that people was actually helping those who wanted to go back home, the children and young people who wanted to go back home to get, uh, to get uh, resources to go back home. So for which I did give thanks. But in the process, COVID actually struck. And then I said, what? We were out to sit at home. But I knew, the Lord had told me very clearly, evangelize at Urupa. So I knew, I knew this was a test. Yes, it was one of the tests I can really testify it was a test. Because I got a lot of people who told me, no, 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 you can't mix. And when I went there, although I had a mask, there are many who did not have masks. There were others who were coughing. Some were worried they are going to die. But uh, anyway, I said, the Lord who told, who brought me here, will you also uh, support me in the process. So as I finished, so the Lord, I realized that the Lord was testing me because when I went home, I would go to now to social media, I would listen to different teachings, and I got interested in the kingdom of God. And as I was listening, I decided to start writing notes. And as I was writing notes, I said, how many people of my age know this, this subject of the kingdom of God? And I realized that the, Jesus talked so much about the kingdom of God. And yet I hear even Christians saying, I am in the kingdom of God. That word does not appear. It, does, it is not a vocabulary. And I was wondering, how can people didn't know about this? And the Holy Spirit said, write a book. And I started now putting notes and sending to my children. And the Lord was insisting. So I didn't know exactly how to start. And um, soon I decided, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to advertise for um, a post, a post for, for an editor. So, and that is what I did in various groups in, um, in uh, social media, in the, in the social media. So people applied and because I have been a manager, so I got this girl called Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I think is here. Elizabeth must, yes, that's, that's the editor. So that's the one who won the, the interview, got the interview, and then we met. We, I remember we met at Hurlingham, and then she looked at what I had typed in my, in my uh, book, in my uh, phone, and she said, Mom, this one, this cannot even be 20 pages, so you better just step on them, and then you, you take them around. And I said, no, I want a book. And she's, she was shocked, and that is after having my lunch. You know, she's telling me to step on things. So, <laughs> so, so what I did is that we find after discussion, a lot of discussion, we agreed, okay, what we are going to do, she said, let's go and draft. I'm going to draft something for you. What is it called? What is this book of yours called? I don't know. Something basic. I have no idea. So... Then, of course, she went, she started drafting. Meanwhile, I'm listening to the, to the teaching specifically on the kingdom of God from various people all over the world. I'm putting my notes. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is now starting speaking to me. 
So even in the night, and up to today, I have my notebook, my pen, and my Bible in the bed, under the pillow. Because when the Lord tells me, I, I, sometimes I even write without, without putting on the lights. So I have to remember. <laughs> so, so, so that is how it was. So by the month of May, we had some idea. So we came together, and we started putting things together. And uh, by, the end of that, by the end of that year, I was becoming more comfortable. And she said, you know, actually, you, you called me to be an editor. So continue to write, and I would edit. So that's how we agreed. And that is how I started. So I started writing a lot about the kingdom of God. And then one day I visited, you know, my, my son Peter visited me and said, Mom, let me see what you are writing. Looked at it and said, Mom, do you know this is not one book? I said, what do you mean? Me, I was, by the way, the title I was given by the Lord. The Lord himself. The king, when I was praying, he actually gave me the title. The kingdom of God entering and maturing in the kingdom. So, so then I said, I have only one title. So, so then I said, how can I have more than one book? I only have one title. And then I remember visiting my, my editor and the husband. And um, my, the husband, Lou, from Nigeria. Lou, you are here. Yes, yes. And, you know, he said, Mom, you know this is not one book. She, you know, he was checking what the wife is editing. Mm. This is not one book. I said, I have one title. And he said, yes, Ma. You know the, the Nigerian way. Yes, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, of course, I knew he was not convinced. Mm. But I was, anyway, finally we met with you in a supernatural way when we were looking at the, the book of uh, Bishop Jenga. And I remember asking you a lot of questions. And very soon we just, you know, we just connected and discovered, oh, we were in Daystar. Yeah. And we were in Loreto. And my daughter was in Loreto. Oh, that, I said, you are going to be my, yeah. my publisher. So we agreed, September, come and see what I've done. And you told me, you know, my clients, my, me, I stay only for three hours. So make sure when I come, I am there for three hours only. I said, fine. When you came, you stay the whole day. Up to four. <laughs> <laughs> up to four. So, and at the, end of, at the end of the day, you said, this is series. So we say, okay, the kingdom of God entering and maturing series. Good. So, the one that, the book that you see here, it is actually the, the, the one that I drafted last. But the Lord was leading me which books comes first, second, and third. So that is how it was. That is the story. So she, was, she, she truly was led by the Holy Spirit, isn't it? So very quickly, maybe you tell us the other six books. What are they called? The other six books? Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So this is the first book. It's going to be uh, the Life is Spiritual is the first book. So the second one that you'll be coming is on the, the, the triune God. And then the, the third one that is going to, uh, no, the, the triune God, then we are going to have Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. And the next one is going to be the Holy Spirit. Yes, our helper. And then the next one is how the, the kingdom, the operation of the kingdom of God. Then I'll have the maturing, maturing Christian, how you mature as a Christian. And then the final one is the enemy of the kingdom of God. Thank you. So very quickly, if you have your book with you, there's uh, page 17, Roman numeral 17. And this is what I'm going to ask uh, Captain Margaret. Can you tell us what to expect? When someone reads this book, what can you expect as you read Life is Spiritual? Okay. I think before I say that is when the Lord gave me to write this book, I received, when I was listening, it was all freely. You know, I received this, the information freely. In fact, as I look at this book, I, I can't imagine I'm the one who wrote it. So I knew it was the Holy Spirit led, and I was praying. I was saying, Lord, remember I'm only a pen in your hand, and therefore lead this book. And that's what he's reading me in all those books, and I thank God. And therefore, I also said that this book, I am not going to, I promise God, I will not even have a soda from this book. This book is going to do the work that I am doing, when I'm alive and when the Lord takes me home, for soul winning. So whatever the profit of this book, it will be for soul winning. We have discussed with my children and we have agreed and it is written down. So that is it. 
So when you look at this book, you, look at, you go to the first chapter, it is on uh, life is spiritual, just to remind us that when somebody dies, you know, people say he's gone or she's gone. Who is gone? The real you. This is a house. The, you know, the, the, the Bible calls us houses or temples of the living God. And therefore, we are spiritual. And that means we need to connect with the spiritual, well, the, the spiritual realm. So we are living in a spiritual, in the, in the physical realm, where we can see each other. But there is also the bigger spiritual realm. So that's the first thing that we are going to read about, which is a lot, which is very powerful and determines what happens in this, in this, in this physical world. If you can remember, you know, for example, the Moses. When Moses hand up, you know, hand a stick, you know, it's called um, a stick, he had a stick, or a, it was a staff. When he was told by God, put it down, it became a snake, right? And it became a snake because the, the kingdom, the realm, the, the spiritual kingdom is very, very powerful. It can change a, a staff into a snake. And you remember when, when later on Aaron went to Pharaoh, he also said, you know, he put, Aaron put his staff. He became a snake, put it down. And then the magicians, Janice and Jabres, they also put theirs. That is from the Satan's kingdom. And they also became snake, the snakes. And this big snake ate the, other, the others. By the way, that, that stuff never, it was never fatter, even after eating the others. Okay. So, so what happens is that, um, so there is so much that you can talk as you, it is very important to, to connect with the spiritual kingdom. Very important. And this book will tell you how to connect. And it's very important to connect because if you don't connect, you'll be in trouble. Because somebody is looking, you know, Satan is looking to destroy you. And he'll destroy you because he's doing things with the sun, with the moon and everything. And we'll target you. So you need to be careful. So that is, that is one. So that's the first chapter on the spiritual realm. There is the, the spirituality of life. So it's very important. The, the next chapter, you read about grace. Grace is divine influence that God gives us. You know, you have grace, grace of speed. You can have grace of having a beautiful marriage, beautiful children. You know, you ha can have graces of doing things, doing things in speed. And of course, you can have exemption. People can be getting sick around you, but you are exempted. So these are the kind of things that you find, you know, the kind of grace. And we can pray for grace. And we are told, Paul told us, it's multifaceted. There are many graces. So you can pray for graces. And then, of course, there is also special favor. And favor, it is that advantage that God gives you. Wherever you go, you just become a friend of whoever you meet. Somebody will call you for a job and they are not calling a brother. So those are the kind of things that you find. Then you go to the dreams. Dreams are very important. We ignore, especially when we have bad dreams. And then we wake up in the morning and we say, it was only a dream, my friend. There is something on the way. So you are being warned. Something is coming. And you need, it tells you what you do when you dream. When you dream good things, pray that it happens. When you, pray, when you dream bad things, because they are demonic dreams, you, you also have to pray against such dreams. <laughs> so that's the next one. And then the word we speak. Many times, you know, in the kingdom of God, there are no jokes. Anything you speak. Imagine I, I just call somebody in the U.S. and they pick the phone. Where did the words pass? They are passing through the spiritual realm. And they are discovered, and they are not going anywhere. If you speak bad things, you can only remove them by the blood of Jesus. So that tells you what you do. So we need to be positive speakers. And it will tell you about the positive speaking. And then the, the, last, the last two chapters is on the altars. The altars, that is where you meet with the spiritual realm. How do you speak? For us Christians, how do you speak with God? Where do you meet? How do you prepare yourself? And remember, you are the first altar. So, and therefore, that means you have to take care of yourself. And how do you feed the altar? Because altars are living and they eat. They eat and they speak and they hear. Even when there is a bad altar here, even if you go to America, that altar will follow you. It will follow, it doesn't go. And you still have problem when you get to the other side. So, you, so those are the things. And you need to uh, protect your children. So def, def, in this, uh, these are the subjects. So they are deep. And you can just read all about them. Yes. Thank you so much. So for those, of the, for those people who are not able to come here, but they are watching online, yes. where can these books be found? 
Okay, these books can be found, if you are online, online and out of Africa, you can get them from Amazon. Amazon, you find them. When you are in Africa, you can get them from Nuria online. Nuria online. And then, and of course, if you are around uh, Osseins Cathedral, you can get them from the bookshop here in Osseins Cathedral. Wow, um, I think we need to give her a big clap. Thank you so, so much. I know you don't want me to move from here, but uh, that's all uh, for now. And I am praying that you actually uh, sit down, read your book slowly by slowly, and like the, the sister said, reflect, chew on it, be taught in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, wow, beautiful. Let's appreciate them once again. Amen, amen, amen. Wow. You know, just while I was seated, I was just speaking some key points, and I think I'm, I'm charged even to, you know, at times we tend to ignore, <laughs> but it is a season indeed just to be alert even in matters to do with the spiritual realm. Thank you so much, Evangelist, Captain, uh, Mom, Margaret, for heeding to the call and hearing the voice of the Lord and in taking it up just to, you know, write this book. Could we appreciate her once again? Amen. And just to honor the Lord for his divine guidance. I think one of the key things I picked, she was able to highlight even sleeping with her notebook and the Bible so that anytime she gets a key message and it made me remember every time I dream and my notebook is far, I'll take my phone, go to the notes and just write it so fast. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Let's just get to here. Can tell us your name? And your kid take away. Buona Sufiwe. My name is Edward Dijero. And I am so much thrilled being here. So much thrilled in, indeed. And one thing which I have uh, learned, which is very important, God spoke to the author. And the author thought this was a small thing. But it is becoming such a huge thing. That is mind-blowing. Very mind-blowing. She thought it was a small thing, but this is serious. Amen? Amen? Can you imagine? And God just talked. Hallelujah. That's what I have learned. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edward. Let's appreciate him. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. Buenas fue, abarienyu. I am very, very privileged to be here at the launch. Congratulations very much, Captain Margaret Thuo, Tata. Um, my name, as I have been introduced, is Daniel Ngomi. Captain Margaret is uh, my auntie, or Tata. Uh, she's my father's sister. And uh, I am here also to speak on behalf of the family. Um, I know we have already spoken um, quite a bit about the book, and about the book launch, uh, but I think it's good for me to also share a few things about where she came from. Because uh, before she became uh, a duo, she was first uh, a gomi. So it would be good for me to give a bit of a background uh, about that. So as, you, as, you, as the English say, an apple does not fall far from the tree. The kikuyu say, gimayu magamotuine. Both sayings highlight the influence of our bringing and family. I think the book of Proverbs 22, verse 6, echoes this sentiment. It says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. Even when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. Captain Margaret, or Mama Duo, as she is known by many, was first a Gomi before she became a Duo. She was the firstborn of the family of Douglas Gomi Wathingira and Sarah Joki Gomi. Sarah Njoki was a remarkable woman of faith. She died at 93, having lived a life of courage and determination. Widowed at 23, she raised her children to become the men and women of faith we see today. Not much is spoken about Sarah Njoki's mother, Captain, Margaret, uh, Captain Margaret's grandmother, Karungari. Karungari was likely born around 1910, 
What we do know about her is that she moved from Kihara area in Kiambu County to Banana and lived on the land of Senior Chief Koinange in the 1920s. Senior Chief Koinange had donated some land to the Church Mission Society, which had formed the first church in Kiamba area, known as CMS Kiamba, in 1914. Today we know that church as St. John's Kiamba Church. Now, I am, I am getting somewhere. Uh, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. So when Karungari uh, joined CMS Kiamba in 1920, she was first pastored by a youthful canon, then known as Samuel Merie. And canon Merie was one of the first people to be ordained as a priest in 1926. That's when he was ordained. And in fact, for those of you who know the history of the Anglican Church, today we're in the Anglican Church. Um, captain Duo is a captain in the Anglican Church. Those of you who know the history, um, canon Merie was, if in fact, the first bishop, if I may put it that way, of what was then called the uh, Diocese of Mount uh, of Fort Hall, which then became Diocese of Mount Kenya, and then from there, all these other dioceses have come. Now, Karungari, who was uh, Captain Margaret's grandmother, became a Christian, was baptized, became Elizabeth, and her daughter, uh, who was Sarah Njoki, was baptized as Sarah. And when the East African Revival Movement swept the church, in the 1920s and 30s, Karungari became the pioneer evangelist in our family. And that divine inheritance of being an evangelist is what was then inherited by Sarah Njoki to become also an evangelist. Our grandmother, her mother, was also an evangelist. Now, Sarah Njoki got married to Kanon Guru's brother. So Kanon Guru, who was the first bishop of the Anglican Church, uh, was Douglas, uh, the brother was called Douglas Gomi, and Captain Margaret was their firstborn child. So you see on her father's side, she had the heritage of uh, the first Anglican bishop. On her mother's side, she had the heritage of uh, evangelism. So Captain Margaret's lineage traces back to the pioneers of the Anglican church and includes strong God-fearing women like her grandmother Karungari and her mother Njoki. They were all evangelists and preachers of the gospel of Christ, and it is therefore not a surprise that Captain Margaret, too, has carried on the tradition and has been called to evangelize the gospel at a time such as this. Now, we all know the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, which says that we're living in the end times when people will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful recognizing the form of godliness but denying the power within. And that is the reason why the book Life is Spiritual is so important for us because it reminds us of the battle against evil in these last days. Now, I know we have already interviewed uh, Captain Margaret and she's talked about the book. People have talked about it. But I wanted to just highlight a few things I personally have learned from that book. I think one thing I can say is that there is a call to holiness. We are reminded to be holy, for our God is a holy God. So for those of you who have bought the book or who will buy the book, when you look at page 50, we are reminded that there is grace available to believers to live a holy life. And the author, Captain Margaret, reminds us about the words in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11, where the Bible says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. The author goes on to say that the grace of God helps believers to live holy lives and to be friends with the Holy Spirit who teaches the believer to enjoy an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That is... Um, You'll see that on page 50 of the book. When you turn to page 64 of the book, there is a call to an intimate relationship with God. That is the second key highlight. And it reminds us, the author reminds us that God speaks to us through his word, through the Holy Spirit, and through situations. It is through this means that men receive visions from God with divine messages. The author goes on to tell us about the words of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I think that that thing that I have learned from this book is on page 132, where there is a call to approach the altar of grace with humility, where we are reminded that God gave us his son to die so that the highest level of sacrifice was made by his son, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, so that all men could be cleansed from all sin and unrighteousness. And the author reminds us, therefore, no man ought to die for his own sins. And the author reminds us of the book, of the, of the words in Hebrews 4, verse 16, which says that, let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Um, I just want to conclude there, but what I can say is that the book Life is Spiritual offers us many valuable lessons, and I hope that this book benefits all our souls. Let us all buy the book because we will benefit ex extensively and extremely. I will conclude to say that the, the message of evangelism and revival that is in that book can be echoed in the song that we used to hear when many of us were growing up, to Kutender as a Yesu. And that song was a famous song that uh, her great grand, her grandmother, who was uh, uh, Karongari, her mother, Saranjoki, used to sing often. And even we, the grandchildren, and uh, learned that song. And particularly, uh, when you hear it in Kikuyu, it says, Netoko Osha Jesu, Jesu Gatoromeka Gai, Nakamea Kune the Ragia, Dako Osha Mwadani. God bless you all. Congratulations, Tata, on your book launch. Thank you. Wow, let's appreciate lawyer Daniel. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Sing hallelujah. As we celebrate our dear sister and mother, she's, I call her mother because I think she's the age mate of my father. So, even not, not even my mother, she's the age mate of my father. So, um, we appreciate you, ma'am, for the wonderful blessing you have been to us. I will not share in terms of a sermon, but I want to, um, alongside what Ngumi has done, or killing Ngumi, and what Captain Margaret has done, just to appetize you a little more as an outsider uh, to this book, um, give her a little bit of a bird's eye view. I know she tried to do that, but allow me to do that, and then I'll bring in, at the conclusion, some three messages uh, to speak to our hearts. 
So I have known Margaret since I came to All Saints uh, eight years ago, but beyond that, I have known her even when I was not at All Saints because our family used to worship here. So I have known her well uh, over 10 to 13 years as a very passionate uh, evangelist, as rightly says. Uh, she went to a college where I went to, uh, that is Church Army, and the character of Church Army is that it trains evangelists. You cannot come from Church Army and just remain normal. Uh, there are several captains here. Who are the captains here from Church Army? If you're a captain, I can see Captain, uh, Captain Maina uh, and, and a few others. So as she did mention, before I just go into the book and pull out some uh, lessons, which I appreciate our Killing Gumi has brought out some of them very well. Uh, Captain has been a member of our congregation uh, and a great supporter of our ministry here and um, a very fearless, a fearless evangelist. She's been a member of the Preachers Club, of uh, our CET, Cathedral Evangelistic Team. And as she did mention, uh, we would see her voluntarily not paid, go the extra mile that even many of us as staff wouldn't do to personally do evangelism to people and lead them to Christ. During COVID, when the country was on a shutdown for a year plus, <coughs> every Tuesday, uh, you'd see her car parked there and she'd walk across to Huru Park. And as she's mentioned in the book, if you've read, she would minister to people one-on-one. -on -one. she will find groups one-on-one. -on -one. So there's one day I'm here, and you know that time the mood is very depressing and everything, so uh, because my boss had gone down with COVID, I'd come around to lead the team here, just hang around and see what's going on as we prepare for services. That's the much we could do. So one day I see a huge truck full of policemen driving here. And I'm like, eh, tumekuja kushikwa, what's going on? Then I see Captain Margaret with them. And she's so friendly and they're so friendly to her and they're docile. You know, watu ambao menyorosho na injili. Sio... Sio wale maofisaza ambao mnaona wakona ukali, ambao tuliko tunapigana na wao pale. Awo menyoroshua, tena wakona uwoga. Uh, na uh, mwinjilisti anawaongoza, wanangoja pale, waliko mepaka hapa kando. And I asked her, what's going on, Captain? He said, no, Provost, we've come to give these people Bibles. I prayed to them. Several of them have given their lives to Christ. And I just want you to pray with them as we give them Bibles. That was a truck full of over 50 police officers. Uh, that's practical, what I saw just here. We prayed with them. She gave each of them Bibles. Uh, and at that time, the clergy she's mentioned, Reverend Kimari, is the one who was then supporting the donation of those Bibles. So, Captain, we remember those things. And I know your passion. Every Tuesday, every, without fail, every single Tuesday, and she'll go alone. You know, one, quote-unquote, a retiree. Two, an older person. Three, a woman, and number four, the country is very, very vulnerable and people fear each other there. But she would go alone. She would not be accompanied by anyone. And so for me, that sets her apart, and I've never seen such a passion uh, anywhere else. So as Captain has introduced herself, you will know her more. If you read this book, then you will know her more. Let me just tell you real quick, uh, from a bird's eye view as an outsider, this is a very easy to read book. It has 180 pages, six chapters as has been mentioned, but very easy to read. Can I shock you? I read it in two hours in one sitting for my first reading. Uh, so it tells you, because in a kuvuta, na unanza kusoma, you want to go serve tea, but you just find yourself reading and reading and reading. And so subsequently, because I needed to do a proper review, even as we come to support us, so I read it a little more times, but the first one I realized it's a new book. Uh, you can read it very quickly. As Ngumi has mentioned, uh, and actually as Captain did mention, it has six chapters, but let me just tell you quickly, from my perspective, what these chapters say. So this book is about life being seen in spiritual eyes. And what this book is trying to tell us is that in life, there is the natural realm where we live, but then there is the spiritual realm. That everything that happens in this life is dictated from those two points. That if you discover the spiritual side, 
then the things that happen in the natural side, the terrestrial side, will go perfectly well because we make agreement with God in the spirit realm and what happens in the spirit realm then dictates and guides everything that happens in the physical realm. So that's basically what the book is trying to say, that there are no chances in this life. Everything is ordered and dictated and directed from the spiritual throne. That is what chapter 1 really, really is trying uh, to tell us. And it's actually saying that uh, to that end, God has availed power to man. God has availed authority to man, but power is resident with God. You can have that authority, but you cannot have the power to exercise that authority. For you to have the power to exercise the authority availed to men, you must tap into the spiritual realm. And that is why she's pulling us, the book is pulling us to develop a living relationship with God so that from the spiritual realm, then you can influence the things that are happening here. It simply says that then we must depend on God. We must depend on God so that once we see God and connect with him, then we can begin to see everything that happens here, not from a coincidence perspective, but dictated by what God actually intends. And that is then how the author brings in, in chapter 1, three beautiful stories. One of them has been read by, has been brought to us by her daughter Sarah. A story, one, of an accident that was to happen on Magadi Road, uh, that she would actually would have died. But because she connected with the spirit realm and grabbed the power there to dictate things, she never got into that accident. But she saw an accident happen right in front of her that would have been her. So when you connect with God at that spirit realm, then he releases you and preserves and protects you when you're here. The second story is the Boston uh, scholarship that she shares of how the Lord really provided. And I think Sarah has added a bit more perspective into the Boston story and the miracle of God's provision there. The third story, which Captain shares in that chapter one from her personal example, is how the Lord opened for her a job to go, work, uh, to go uh, take up a role in New York when everyone else in the Addis office was being laid off. And everybody was shaking and freaking. But then how she sought to control things from the spirit realm. Then she went into prayer, and that going into prayer then released her into a space uh, of connecting deeper with God. Then God raised things, which were not coincidences. Coincidences. They were ordered from the throne of grace, and she found herself in New York. The money she was now freaking and almost getting scared that she would not finish paying her apartment that she was buying, the Lord provided through that. So chapter one, really opens your eyes to the spirit realm. That if you connect with God, connect with the spirit realm, then everything that happens here will be so perfect. So we seal transactions up in the spirit realm through prayer. Then God manifests miracles here, physically, this other side. Chapter 2 then opens up for us an understanding of what grace is. And I love it when she says... In page four, on page 48, that grace is spiritual. And when God releases it to us, then we achieve results easily. So then grace sets us on rolling to conform to what God has ordained for us in the spirit realm. So everything is prepackaged for us, is available. That's what the book is trying to say in chapter 2. Is available and prepackaged but you must connect with God, then that grace pulls it off from the throne of grace, then releases it and you see its manifestation. So she's saying in that chapter two that grace therefore brings victory and it is through grace that then that we begin to see uh, lots and lots of transformation. So grace then picks somebody who was a nobody and that grace then converts them into somebody because God is at work in them. This section therefore outlines, as she did mention briefly, different types of graces. And I would want you to read uh, page 57. It tells you different types of graces, but it ends uh, in chapter 2 by highlighting what Captain Thor calls the killers of grace. Because God sometimes avails grace, but because of how carelessly and casually we live, 
uh, inflated by ego and pride and sin and self-centeredness, then we lose step with God, then we fall from that grace, then there are killers who come then to kill grace. And that's why you see people who are once exalted, once wonderful, once thriving, even in faith, but then their end just comes, boom, because there's something called grace killers. If you want to discover whether you are in a situation where there is a killer of grace in your life, I'll not mention what those killers are. Please, can you grab a book and look at page 57 going onwards? You'll see if there is something that is killing grace inside of you. That's why probably things are not happening the way they are. Chapter 3 is actually, as she's mentioned, about dreams and visions. And I, one, one thing I love most is the definition of vision here. And, and, and this is away from your academic uh, conventional definition of vision as you study in strategic planning or in leadership, which is very different. From a spiritual perspective, Captain Margaret defines vision as a spiritual roadmap that is endowed with heavenly guidance, allowing individuals to see into the future what God has in store for them before they are delivered. Did you hear that? That grace is that spiritual package and roadmap that opens heaven for you. Then you see heaven, what God has ordained for you. Then you bring it into reality before it is delivered. Friends, that is not possible unless you connect with God at the spirit realm. That is why this book is saying life is spiritual. So many times we miss a lot of things because we fail to connect to see things before they happen. But then I love also what it says about dreams. It says that dreams are prophetic avenues through which God speaks to us. And you heard her mention that she lives with a book, a notebook next to her head, and when the Lord speaks, then she writes. And so she, this chapter is telling us that as a believer, life is completely spiritual and dreams become prophetic voices through which then uh, God speaks to us. But then there are demonic dreams that the evil one deposits in our spirits. This book gives you that extra. You know those ones of uh, Pisa on Tuesday. Buy one, get one free. You know, buy one, get one free. So there's a buy one, get one free here. So grab this book and you will see from page 67 going onwards that extra. Uh, so you'll see one, how do I interpret dreams? But two, how then do I deal with demonic dreams? Chapter four, uh, is about the words we speak. And I think Captain did mention that here very well. Uh, Captain gives caution to any believer that you must be careful about what you say. Anything you say about yourself or anyone else or a situation around you. Because, as the Bible says, words have power. Tongue has the power of life and death. And whatever we confess is what we become. So this book, therefore, is a warning to any believer to recognize that there is spiritual power in the words that we speak. And as I was reading, actually, on page 98, I discovered that there are things, actually, that even for me, I've been saying about myself, and they come to be because I give them power through my confession. One of them, my wife, uh, who is also very spiritually aware and has very high spiritual sensitivities, Dr. Selena, Many times, you know, these casual things, you're a believer, but then you just speak so casually and so carelessly. So I'd say, hey, hey, hey baby, I'm so, I'm so broke. But then she would rebuke me and say, no, don't confess that. Why are you confessing poverty and, and, and being broke? So confess abundance, and then abundance will follow you. And I've recognized that when I speak positively, especially on abundance, even on our children, and even on my situations, even in my ministry, then the Lord opens up a bubble of extra provision uh, in every space. And therefore, this book then gives you some tips. I love what it says in Psalm 109, verse 18. He says this. He quotes the psalm. He's saying this. He wore cursing as his garment and entered into his body like water, into his bones like oil. So whatever we say, becomes a curse, they get into our bodies like water, they get into our bones like oil. So please be careful about what you confess. You've seen so many people 
who live miserable lives, not because God wanted them to be miserable, but because they've invited misery through what they enthrone. What you confess is what you enthrone. And so that then means uh, the enemy gets a foothold, which this book, so Paul writing to Timothy uh, says, do not give the evil one a foothold. But this book calls it um, uh, a legal ground. Don't give the devil a legal ground to hold. A uh, lawyer there will tell you there are things that when you do or you say, then uh, you are losing it already legally because there's, there's a law that grabs you, uh, Mahala Pali. And therefore, uh, I love chapter 4 because it wants me as a believer that even the words have spiritual power. Chapter 5 and 6, and I love uh, the way Captain has said, chapter 5 and 6 for me are, 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 twins, are twins. So these are sister and they are twin because they both talk about altars. Chapter 5 brings out the details around altars as uh, spiritual entities. But chapter 6 therefore highlights uh, what we call, this book calls demonic or satanic altars. Chapter 5 explains that human beings meet God at the altar. That altar becomes the contact point where God allows interaction between him and humanity. And it is at the altar where then God's, God hands power to humanity, as I said earlier from chapter 1, on how to exercise authority that is already in the hands of man. So there are altars. So an altar is very important. Um, in, in dodgy or questionable churches, you'll find somebody in America, Ka altar pale. Uh, where I come from, uh, the Legio Maria. If you walk into any Legio Maria home, as you, they must have an altar with Ondeto. Ondeto is the, the Messiah, sort of, that they believe. A picture of Ondeto there and all paraphernalia, or rosary and everything there. That's an altar. When you set an altar like that, it could be demonic or it could be divine and uh, spiritual on God's side. But that is a, a contact point. So if it's an evil altar, then it's a contact point with the kingdom of darkness. So you attract demonic powers then to come and manipulate you from that point. So what Captain is explaining here is that uh, altars then become an interface, a point of convergence between heaven and earth, between uh, God's power and us as human beings. So if you are not a believer, if you're not saved, if you're not saved, and I'm going to finish with something about that. If you're not a believer, if you never committed your life to Christ, then your life is so exposed to the kingdoms of darkness and to the evil altar altars that they claim a lot about you. But when you're a believer, then you're in contact with God's altar, the kingdom of God. That's why even here in the sanctuary, we pray with people at the altar. When you kneel at that altar, and that's why even for marriage, we take you up to the altar because we are setting a covenant between you and God. So when you go into an evil contact, go to a witch doctor or any evil thing, there is a seal that is connected, that is created between you and, and that place. The author in chapter 5 explains then what happens at the altar. So there is a transaction at the altar, which he calls exchange. So you can release your soul uh, or the devil can claim something from you. At the altar, from a positive, spiritual, divine Yahweh perspective, there is a transaction. You can lay a burden, and then the Lord clothes you with honor there. So there are lots that happens there. She mentions things like communing with God. It's a place where you develop friendship with God. It's a place of covenants. So at the altars, we, we make covenants. And, 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 and one of the things I did when I was growing up as a young believer uh, was to pray for my wife even before I met her, way, way before I met her. I would make covenants with God. I would pray, God, may you bless her womb. May you bless the children that we'll have. So I'll covenant with God over the wife that I'd marry. So an altar is a place of covenanting with God. Uh, real quick, as I come to finish chapter 6, then delves deeper into the demonic side of altars and says that Satan actually exists. And he establishes altars with the intention, as Captain mentioned, of destroying humanity and destroying 
their destinies. So when you look around, because life is spiritual, when you look around, even the things that are happening in this country now, there are no chances at all. Captain has told us there are no chances. Even what's happening now. You know there are many evil altars that have been established in this country. So they become active points that the enemy just activates and then they come into being. Things like poverty. So demonic altars, the enemy will activate and you just see poverty. Have you gone to a region where nobody can go to school? Have you ever seen that? You go to a whole region, what always is Soma, Kohio region, or you go to a region where people are so poor that no one just comes up at all. Even if government takes what? Even last mile in Akata, wapeleke ata nini mashinani in Akata. There are territorial spirits in charge of poverty, some in charge of failure to go to school, others are for religion. Where nobody, people will not believe. Have you, will not believe in the Lord. Have you gone to regions where people are against hostility against the gospel? Uh, and you just see, and you near, realize there are altars of gods that were worshipped there, and before those altars are broken, those communities or regions will remain enslaved forever. And therefore, this book opens your eyes to see the territorial spirits and altars around you, and then releases you to know how to break them, but also to build gold, godly altars. For me, that's a positive thing. So it shows you how then to build a godly altar that then will exalt the name of the Lord and just allow the Lord to flourish in those spaces. Amen? Amen? So the last two chapters are laden or are loaded with the language of spiritual warfare, as you have heard me say. And Captain says that she's done training and certification in, and in deliverance and spiritual warfare. This, these two chapters take you into what I call, in my own words, the war room. So chapter 5 and chapter 6 takes you into the war room and equips you then on how to take head on the evil powers. And, and that is a weapon for a Christian. If I were to advise Joyce, what would we do differently as we author, as we publish the next books? I'm just coming to the end. My, my suggestions to the author and to the publisher. Number one, two, one. I was so moved by the personal stories in chapter one, but I missed them as I was moving to chapter two, three, and four, and five and six. So consider including more personal stories and testimonies that practically demonstrate uh, the spiritual teachings being carried in each section. And you can spread it out in such a manner that every chapter has a personal story from Captain that then gives you a sneak preview into how our li her life has demonstrated the spiritual teaching that is being taught there. Um, because then that gives you more appetite to read. I can tell you, chapter one I think I read so quickly because it just carried me off. I woke up in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep from 11.30, so I said, ah, let me grab this book and read. So after I started reading, I said, let me go to the kitchen and make some uh, lemon tea. Uh, before I, finish. I couldn't get to the kitchen. I just read and read and read and read and read because those personal stories were so, were so powerful to me, uh, those testimonies. The second suggestion that I'd give to the publisher and to the author is, please, this book is spiritual. This is not your academic book, as I said. It lays out a spiritual map that needs to guide a believer on how to grow needs to guide somebody who has been established in faith to accelerate their spiritual faith. It also gives you space as a non-believer to discover what God can do. So a non-believer can read this book. A believer who is just young can read this book. A mature believer still can read this book. But what I'd want to suggest for future editions that are coming out of this series is to consider at the end of every chapter reflections that then challenge me to think a lot more deeper of what I have read in that chapter and how that relates to my personal life. Uh, for example, if you talk about, um, if you're talking about words as spiritual, spoken words as spiritual, then I have some several questions, seven, eight, or nine, that then asks me to reflectively think about that more. Then it goes deeper into my spirit and I pick out lessons there. 
I would have added more and more, but let me stop there. What are key lessons then as I end? Three. This book teaches us about salvation. But as it talks about love as spiritual, it teaches about salvation. And I'll read. Um, I'll read 1 Corinthians, uh, second, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, uh, real quick. The Bible says, but at, as it is written, um, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed, revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deeper things of God. That this book gives you a deeper understanding into who God is and what God's intention for us is. God's intention for us is to relate to him through salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you read it, uh, then you will find yourself being led to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're here, you've never made a decision for Christ. This book is inviting you to make a decision for Christ because if you don't do that, then your life is being drained by the enemy and you're living laboriously, things that are easy, that should be quick, quick, quick and falling into place. You're struggling and straining in this life because you're outside of Jesus Christ. That life is full of regrets. Life is full of marriages that are refusing to work, children that are stubborn because you are out of salvation of Jesus Christ. But when you are in Jesus, then the things no eye has seen, the things no mind has conceived, the things no ear has heard, are the things that the Lord has ordained for us because he reveals them to us in his spirit. Amen? So lesson number one, consider accepting our Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Number two, for me, I see this book opening a huge minefield for us at the place of prayer. So I talked about war room, but then this book takes us into the prayer room. And so I pray that you may develop a deeper appetite to spend time in the prayer room. Because when you see what Margaret is seeing, when you see marriages failing, when you see a country like ours on the brink of collapse, when you see um, poverty chewing up communities, when you see accidents claiming people on the roads, when you see the economy collapsing, when you see unnecessary and immature deaths happening left, right, and center, then this book sends you to the prayer room that you need to rise up and pray. The third and the last thing is that this book gives us practical steps to victorious Christian living. Not Christian living, but I'm using uh, victorious it shows you how to be a victor, not to be a weakling in the kingdom of God. And I pray that you'll grab a copy so that out of this book, you may live victoriously. Amen? Amen. Congratulations, Captain Margaret. May the Lord who deposited this vision in your heart release the remaining six books that shelves will be filled with this book, but lives will be transformed that his name will be glorified through you. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And at this point, it's, it's now the moment we have all been waiting for, yeah? Where we get to unveil, where we get to, you know, reveal and officially launch this great book. And just like we have been told, this is just a series. It's a series of books, and we are going to be launching the first book in this series. The Kingdom of God Entering and Maturing Series. Let's appreciate the Lord for this. If this is his doing, wow, wow. Before we get into that section, I want you to turn to your neighbor as well and just get to ask them, even from you know, as the provost was sharing, it was also a wake-up call for us. Like he shared the three key things to be able to, you know, get into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah? Could you just share with someone what you got to pick as we get on to that next section? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, provost, for guiding us and leading us. 
And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move on to this exciting, exciting bit of this extraordinary book launch. And I'd just like to welcome Provost to join me here. Let's appreciate him as he joins me. Thank you so much. Together with Reverend, you can join. I'd also like to welcome Evangelist Margaret Duo. Let's appreciate her. <laughs> Wow, so, so beautiful. Wow, thank you so much. The children can also join. Thank you. Thank you. Let's appreciate the children as well. Thank you. I'd like to officially hand over to Provost to share with us before we move on. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, what I meant to see. I want to call all the ministers here. So, uh, the person in the somewhere. Uh, I saw a lot of pastors from Center, was it of Baptist? Please join us up here. All the pastors who are around, please join us up here as we do the dedication. Just come around and get the blessed captain. So, um, this is what we're going to do. So, captain, we hold one Caesar and I hold the next. Just come, just come, come to the red captain. We're not going to red captain. We're not going to be pulling, we're pulling for the red captain. We're not going to be pulling for the red captain.
So we thank God for such a beautiful launch. The Lord was present. I also want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank all the speakers, all the people who came here, starting with the provost. Wasn't that powerful? So we thank God for that. But um, realizing, of course, God plans everything. He's brought everything together. And um, mom, thank you for following the, uh, the leading of the Lord. If you hadn't done that, we wouldn't be here. So thank you for doing that. And uh, that's a great example. Um, there was a lot of folks who were planning this in the background. Where is the editor? And uh, yeah, there you are. Right? The publisher, yep, all those guys. Let me tell you, these guys were getting, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 calls a day from mom. Um, so we thank God for all those who are involved, some who are not even um, mentioned. Technical team, the uh, media, you know, everybody. Uh, Pastor Jason, where are you? Yep, thank you. Um, the ushers, the welcome team. Right? Um, am I missing anybody? Zena? Where is Zena? Thank you. <laughs> yep. So, really, this is a thank you for each and every person, even if I didn't mention your name. Just know that this is a thank you from mom, from our family, from, you know, basically, uh, really from everybody. So, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So, again, to each and every person. And, you know, for taking your time, I know Saturdays are busy days, but for you to plan to be here and really um, just being present. So thank you uh, again to each and every person. Lastly, um, before we close, I want to say a big thank you to the MC. Can you just give her a big hand clap? Wasn't she awesome? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Okay. Um, did I miss anybody else? And all those guys behind the cameras, thank you. Each and every one of you. So, again, thank you so much. It was a fantastic job. I mean, it was awesome. And, again, we thank God once again for allowing all this to come together. Because we're already not for the Lord. Things like this won't happen. But it is God, and we have to keep recognizing him and keeping him center stage. Because, again, let's remember this is ministry. This is about the Lord, a God who's done amazing things. I'm going to add one more thing and say that people write books. People preach. You know, there's all things, you know, all kinds of things going on around us. But there's a question about authenticity. And I'm so glad for our Dan, who gave a background of mom going back generations. What you really see today is an authentic ministry. Something that goes way back. And so when you're getting into it, because that's always a question. Is this true or is this false? Where does this fall? What you're really seeing is an authentic ministry, something basically that goes back decades. Because, again, that's the kind of God that I call our mom, by the way, uh, that mom serves. And that's the God she introduced us to. So it's an authentic ministry. So please get yourself a copy and realize that, again, this is authentic. Um, it's not the, some of the kind of stuff that we see on the street. So God bless each and every one of you. On top of saying thank you, may the Lord bless each and every one of you. And then as you go out those doors, remember you're going to the mission field. The mission field is out there. So don't sit on your talents. Don't sit on what God has given you. That was something else that we just got today. All right? So don't sit on what God has given you. Do not sit on it. Use it for ministry because that was what God intended it to be. And so let's live our lives like God would want us to live. And do not sit on your talents. Serve the Lord in any way you can. Because again, when the time comes, we'll be answerable. So thank you so much. I just have to keep saying thank you. Because this was beautiful. And we're just so grateful. God bless each one of you. And um, again, MC, great job. That was fantastic. God bless you. Thank you, thank you so very much. Wow, indeed, it has been an honor just to serve as well as your MC. My name is Anne Nyakinwa Gadura, and I fellowship at Satan Clay City. I'm born again, and I love the Lord, and 
it has been an honor just to serve here. Amen? Amen. Wow. Could we appreciate the Lord once again? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. At this point, I'd like us to welcome Rev. Thank you, Rogod Almighty, for granting us a beautiful uh, occasion in which, Rogod Almighty, we have experienced your goodness, even your presence. We thank you, Rogod Almighty, even for our mom, our aunt, our friend, Evangelist uh, Margaret, oh God. We thank you for her life, oh God Almighty. Pray that in Jesus' name, that you continue to read her, to guide her, even pro to protect her from all powers of darkness and evil. The Lord God Almighty, you continue to grant her good health and sound mind. The Lord God Almighty, you continue to uphold her with your righteous right hand. We thank you, Lord God Almighty, for everyone who came, for the children, for the friends, for the relatives, oh God. May your blessings rest upon every one of them, oh God Almighty. As they go back to their homes, we pray the Lord, your mighty presence will be with them. Protect them from all danger and evil. Let your goodness shine upon them. Give them your peace, even like a liver. Oh God, because you are good shepherd, may you shepherd their souls into all goodness, into all grace and mercies. Lord God Almighty, we pray that in Jesus' name, the Lord God Almighty, you enable us to have many more of such occasions, oh God Almighty, even in celebrating the next coming series, oh God, for the glory and honor of your precious name. And now the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord do kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. The Lord God Almighty bless you. Network, and we want to thank you once again for joining us in this special occasion. God bless you.